what's the purpose of a conspiracy theory? Why is it that people hold on to conspiracy theories? And that's an interesting question. And I think um, what is happening there is that people are in, you know, they have a need to explain bad things. Um, let's look at something tragic like the uh, Boston bombing or the uh, 9-11 terrorist attacks. I mean, those are horrible, horrifying events. And in a sense, they were completely random. They were unexpected. They came out of nowhere. Uh, and, and that's what makes them incredibly frightening, because the fact that they are unpredictable, random, and boom, all of a sudden they're there. That That's scary, isn't it? It's really scary. So how do you deal with that? Well, one way in which people can deal with scary events is to create a an explanation that that puts some sense into this uh, event, and it turns out there is data to suggest that um, if you explain something through a conspiracy and by having an enemy, that that is actually making you feel better. It is actually giving you a sense of control as a person. Um, that if you can explain an un unexpected event through an, a malicious enemy that's out to get you. That sounds terrible, but in actual fact, it gives people a sense of control, makes them feel better. So this leads to the question that I think I was thinking as I read your papers a lot, which is, is there something unique about conspiratorial thinking or is it just part of a person's array of responses to situations? In other words, is there something about this particular way of thinking that's a syndrome or that a certain kind of person does all the time? Or is it just, you know, you face uncertainty, uh, you need an answer, or you face, uh, a, a, let's call it an assault on ideology, you need an answer, you need to know why the other people are wrong. And so you just, your mind just spins things out. Wh is, which one is it? Well, I think it's a mixture of both, uh, I would, I would uh, be inclined to say. There, there is some evidence that conspiratorial thinking is usually fairly widespread, that if a person believes in one conspiracy theory, they're likely to believe in others as well. Uh, there is a statistical association. So people who think that MI5 killed Princess Diana, they probably also think that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald didn't act by himself when he killed JFK, but that they're they more likely than just the average population. Exactly. Exactly. So there is a statistical association. People tend to cluster in such a manner that if they endorse one theory, they tend to also endorse others. Um, and that association is actually fairly strong. So I think to some extent there, there is a cognitive style there. That's what I would call it. I think it is just a way of looking at the world. Um, by, by having the style of thinking that invokes conspiracies very readily. So there are clearly people uh, uh, who, who fall within that uh, cluster of, of uh, uh, thinking on the one hand. Um, so on the other hand, however, I think it is also uh, situation specific. And let's talk about science a little bit, because the reason I got interested in conspiratorial thinking is um, – only because I'm I'm a scientist and I'm passionate about being a scientist because I happen to think that that is probably the best way humans have discovered to date to understand the world around them. We share that view on this show. <laughs> I'm sure you do. And so I was fascinated by the fact that there are so many people out there who reject scientific findings uh, that they don't like for other reasons. Now, Turns out that if you look at that, if you look at science denial, you find that there's almost invariably uh, a conspiratorial streak to that um, rejection. So let me give you a few examples. Um, people who reject the link between HIV and AIDS uh, very often think that the U.S. government um, created AIDS God knows why. You know, there's a number of hypotheses that these people advance, but there's always a conspiratorial element in there. Um, people who reject um, vaccinations in particular are often very uh, aggressive in their rejection and resorting to conspiracies. Saying they think that the government is involved somewhere or, or big pharma is involved. Big pharma, yeah. government, okay. indeed. So um, 
And then finally, if you look at climate science, I think there it is perhaps uh, more obvious than anywhere else. For example, we have a, a sitting U.S. senator um, from Oklahoma. and I, I Senator should, Inhofe. Indeed, indeed. And I should add that I was at the University of Oklahoma for five years in the 1990s. Oh, okay. So I, I have some <laughs> association with uh, Oklahoma, although I've never met Senator Inhofe. Um, now, he wrote a book. Uh, last year called The Greatest Hoax, How the Global Warming Conspiracy Threatens Your Future. Well, that puts it right front and center. <laughs> yeah. It does, doesn't yes. it? I mean, you know, he's saying, hey, hello, global warming is a hoax. It's a conspiracy by scientists. Now, he's actually written a book with that title. Mm -hmm. And, well, what else do you need in a That's sense? It's a catchy title. <laughs> it's a catchy title. It's right out there. He's accusing scientists of uh, conspiring for God knows what reason, I still haven't understood what we're supposed to be doing and why we're doing well, they it. Think it's a, they think it's ideological. They think that you want to bend, uh, bend the world's governments to your way of seeing things. Oh, yes. Yeah. The world government. Well, indeed. Yes, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's, I mean, it is. It, I mean, but, but just to be fair, they think it's an ideology counter to theirs and you do anything you can to advance it, including making the puppets move. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, when you start to think about it, given how overwhelming the evidence is in all the cases that I've mentioned, when you're looking at HIV and AIDS, when you're looking at the effectiveness of vaccinations, when you're looking at the evidence for climate change, it is so absolutely overwhelming that if you can't handle that, what are you going to do? other than invent a conspiracy amongst the scientists. I mean, in a sense, it's a very logical thing to do. If 97 out of 100 climate scientists tell us that the globe is warming from greenhouse gas emissions, well, and you don't like that for whatever reason, maybe because you got money from Exxon, um, what are you going to do about it? Well, really, the only thing you can do is to say, well, those 97 out of 100 climate scientists are engaged in a conspiracy. And so a lot of people are now saying that. And it's exactly the same with AIDS denial. Um, you know, the evidence is absolutely, totally overwhelming. So how do you dismiss that? Well, President Mbeki of South Africa, who rejected the evidence uh, that linked HIV to AIDS, um, he called it racist Western medicine. And therefore was able to dismiss it basically by invoking uh, a conspiracy. And the same is true wherever you look. When there is science denial involved, the people who don't like the science are often invoking a conspiracy. I'm interested to unpack a little more the trait aspect of this. Uh, you know, you, you said it's in part a cognitive style, a way of thinking does that is there something more deep, some other kinds of set of traits, some kind of person? I mean, we hear the word paranoid a lot. Uh, yes, there uh, uh, that is correct. There is again a statistical association between the propensity to uh, endorse conspiracy theories and um, some paranoia, some tendency to to feel uh, persecuted. Um, and there's also an association between people's um, disgruntlement and their disappointment uh, with society and their economic insecurity that predicts uh, whether or not they're likely to endorse conspiracy theories. So there is a literature that is painting a fairly consistent picture of what kind of people tend to engage in conspiracy theorizing. 